If you talk holidays, you must talk food, you must talk food, you must talk food with our bearer of a sack of goodies this holiday season. <laughs> Ho, 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 it's our Aye, aye, aye. Did Santa ever say, aye, aye, aye? I bet he did. <laughs> so before I get to t- say that it is the season for citing food trends, <laughs> so the lists are starting to come out already. I shouldn't say already. It's the end of the year. Um, so my Santa story is my my five-and-a-half-year-old niece said to me a month or so ago, Uncle Arthur, why is your stomach so big? <laughs> <laughs> so I had the fourth I, I said, because I'm Santa. And she l- looked at me, and then she wa- and walked without saying anything, walked away, but then came back a little while later, and she said, you're not Santa. <laughs> and I, so then we went to Radio City Music Hall before they've closed down, and before New York City closed down again. Uh, we did get to see the uh, Christmas Spectacular on December 4th. And after the show, she said, um, I know you're not Santa, Uncle Arthur, because he was on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I said, do you really believe in Santa Claus? She said, well, who else would bring all those gifts? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, there you go. Anyway, I am not bringing gifts. I'm bringing trends today. My friend Michael Whiteman, who I have to say is an internationally uh, acclaimed uh, restaurant consultant and former restaurateur, he doesn't own a restaurant since, he operated Windows on the World, which came down, as we all know, 20 years ago. But Michael continues to do some consulting, even in this day and age when his... Let's, well, we will go there because it's part of Michael's trends list, of course, is uh, what COVID has done. Um, so, and then I'll get to, after I, you know, the sort of generalize here, I want to say that he has a list of buzzwords, every one of which I have a comment on, so I'm going to do that. But um, the main thrust here is that nobody wants to work in restaurants anymore. And we know this, uh, I know this from personal experience. Uh, Bob and I had a craving for uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, chicken pot pie, uh, not the fried chicken, which is very iffy, I find, at our local KFC. But the pot pie is usually pretty good. So we go to get a pot pie one day, and nobody's coming to the window, nobody's coming to the window, nobody's coming to the window, so we drove away. Then we go back a couple weeks later, and, and there was somebody working inside, but she was alone, apparently. We go another uh, a day, and there, it is closed. So they have no, and they have big signs in every window saying they're, they're hiring. So this is a big problem. Of course, Michael has to cite that, but what that's resulted in is a speed up. You know, the pandemic has speeded up so many things. In this case, robotics in restaurants because nobody wants to work anymore certainly they don't want to be flipping burgers at 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 minimum wage in a hamburger joint so let's say that one of the big developments this year and according to michael is going to you know totally become volcanic is um machines that will flip your burgers at a fast food place operate the fry basket uh, 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 all of this in a safe way. So um, if you, and you will have, and by the way, there are, these are operating already in 11 White Castle locations. What I do love about Michael Whiteman's um, trends list is that he does give you many, many examples. Michael's an old journalist. Um, I laugh about this. I don't think he does. But when I was in college, I, I had a, an internship with the uh, Magazine Publishers Association, got to say I was proud. I was in the first group ever, and it was very competitive. Uh, but I, I, I was in this, and Michael at the time was the editor of Nation's Restaurant News, which is the still the um, industry newspaper. I, neither of us remembered either of us, except that I found in my uh, memorabilia box <laughs> not that long ago, well, years ago now, um, the, the, uh, I guess it was the year, the, the, the internship summation, they published a little book, and there was Michael's picture as editor. 
So he's a he's a very good journalist, is is what I mean to say. So it's and, and White Castle and the fast food places are not alone in trying to um, uh, robotize uh, the industry. Uh, people are even wary of servers in restaurants. I don't know how it is by you. But I went out for the first time, really, to a place like this in two years. I went to a supper club last week, and you needed to be, of course, vaccinated and show proof and blah, blah. Uh, I am fully vaccinated and boosted. Um, but we got two days later, we got a, a message from the club saying one of the servers tested positive, and we should all go get tested today. Today's the day I'm supposed to get tested because it takes five days, apparently, to show up in a test. But you can't get a test in Brooklyn today, probably not tomorrow either, because the lines to get tested are literally around the block. You could wait two to three hours to get uh, 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 tested, and there are no more, or maybe this morning I'll be able to find one. Well, there are no more home tests. But that, so that's what's gone on with the restaurant industry. Meantime, I don't know what's going on by you, but around here there still are a lot of restaurants that have what I consider really stupid outdoor seating because it's not outdoors. Uh, they're outdoors, but it's home. It, there's still confined areas, and now that the weather is really cold, it's now only 25 degrees here, um, who's going to eat out there unless it's all enclosed and with heating lamps? It's illegal in New York City to have uh, uh, those gas heaters, propane heaters. So a restaurant has to spend a huge amount on electric heaters, and I don't get it. So, And you're still in a confined area. So moving on, Michael Whiteman says, the condiment of the year is something called... Chili Crunch, and that is, by the way, a registered trademark, and it's a crunchy, con- hot, crunchy condiment. I, By all descriptions here, since I have not even seen this product in the store, it is some kind of sambal. Uh, now, sambal, which is a Southeast Asian chili paste, um, does not have, by the way, sugar in it. Uh, which is why I prefer to buy that over the other uh, chili uh, sauces, like for want of a better condiments uh, that are available. There's the gujang, or, I'm totally mispronouncing that, the Korean one, and um, oh, my brain is going. Uh, uh, the other one, anyway, the one that's so popular that everybody's making. In any case, those two have sugar. I'll think of it in a second. Those two have sugar. Uh, the the sambal I buy does not have sugar. I asked um, uh, Joanne, uh, my chef friend upstairs, who is from Singapore, uh, what brand to buy of sambal, and she said, I don't know, I make my own. But, you know, it, it is that kind of sauce, that kind of chili paste is, in fact, very, very trendy. Moving on... Um, Ghost kitchens are something I only learned about from Michael's um, uh, current 2021 forecast. But um, he wrote about this apparently in, as, in 2017, four years ago. Ghost kitchens are kitchens uh, that have no restaurant attached but are strictly in existence to provide food for take-home. Or delivery. Uh, that's my shortest description of a ghost kitchen, but Michael does go on for several pages about ghost kitchens, so I'm assuming this is super important. And to the industry, this newsletter, by the way, this uh, trends letter, is mainly read, well, I would say almost exclusively read, you're getting a preview here, uh, by people in the industry, by hotel and um, uh, restaurant owners. Uh, hotels especially. Michael's very big in consulting with hotels. He, uh, so, so flavor trends. Um, you know, I have trouble with this uh, because I'm old probably, uh, but also because I'm jaded. Uh, with 
even on television, I see everything has to explode in your mouth. If it doesn't, if it isn't like 18 flavors in one bite, then it's not good. I'm into one flavor in one bite. I like plain broiled chicken. <laughs> I like steamed broccoli, with, maybe with a little olive oil and lemon juice on it, but not too much more. But one of the uh, uh, the flavor craving uh, items uh, that are, we're going to see this year are Korean hot dogs which are not corn dogs, even though they could be, they look like corn dogs, uh, but they're a hot dog dipped in batter and then coated with who knows what. You think of it, they'll put it on a hot dog. Sriracha, that's the other hot sauce that I couldn't think of. Sriracha is everywhere. Um, I don't know about this chunky one that Michael cites, but I know sriracha is like, I mean, I went to buy sriracha for the first time, and I was so confused because there was so many brands of sriracha. <laughs> Ends up sriracha is not a traditional Southeast Asian uh, condiment at all. It was invented by a Southeast Asian person, I think, I'm not sure, I think he could be Chinese even, in San Francisco. And uh, it's just become a thing. And the, by the way, the original sriracha does come in a plastic squeegee bottle that has Chinese all over it, written, all, or maybe it's even Thai written all over it. I don't know. I never paid real attention. But um, it's Asian writing on it. And it makes you think that this must come from Asia when it comes from the West Coast. The other one is I have to always. Whenever I say this, I always think of Haagen Dazs ice cream. You do know, Marshall, that Haagen Dazs was invented by a Jew in the Bronx. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you may. You mentioned so, that. Uh, yeah, and it, it would, but originally, and I don't know when originally was, but I'm guessing now it's the '60s, late '60s. They they marketed it as if it was made in Denmark. And that's why it was called Hagen Daz, <laughs> a fake um, Danish word. And on the top of, of the lid, it was the map of Denmark. So it was totally phony, you know. I mean, it was a revolutionary product in its day. But anyway. But you, 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 so you... the other trend that Michael cites is Korean scrambled eggs. I have not seen this anywhere, but I'm, if I call Michael later, he wakes up later than I do. <laughs> I'm going to find out where, if anywhere, he had in New York or in the neighborhood, even better, Korean scrambled eggs. But Korean scrambled eggs are not just scrambled eggs. It's, 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 um, it's a sweet and savory thing with eggs in it. It's like a fried sandwich. I'm not sure exactly, even though there's a picture of it on Michael's <laughs> newsletter. Um, apparently, uh, uh, it's, oh, here he says, not yet sweeping the U.S. He's predicting this. Butter-saturated egg sandwiches, they are taking root in Hong Kong, Singapore, Manila, Los Angeles, and a few Canadian cities. Oh, not New York yet, strangely, so I can't get one in the neighborhood. But I bet you any minute we will. Now, here's, here's a trend that I find rather disgusting, and I've, I've told this to Michael. Maybe he got this one from me, but that we really are experiencing a period of really gross ice cream flavors. You know, have you noticed? Absolutely. I mean, they really, the, the stranger, the better, apparently. We have a very, very, uh, I'm going to say important ice cream a store here in Brooklyn that is now, I think, national. They're marketing it all over the place, called Ample Hills. Now, the original Ample Hills store is in my neighborhood, and then they opened up a, a, another store at the edge of my neighborhood, and that's actually where they manufacture the ice cream. It's in Gowanus. And then they opened up a third place just recently, a real ice cream parlor uh, right along Prospect Park, a great place for the night, and next to a movie theater, like the perfect place for an ice cream parlor. But you know what? I can't eat the ice cream. It, the, besides that the flavors are all bizarre or have more candy in them than ice cream, uh, the, 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 the texture has become so dense that it doesn't taste like ice cream anymore. So here's another Brooklyn ice cream place that has created a really gross flavor, macaroni and cheese ice cream 
with candied bacon? Please. Yeah. Van Leeuwen. Avoid Van Leeuwen. They're a local ice cream parlor, too. So, um, uh, you know, ordering at the bar is a trend, Michael says. I don't know. I started doing that 25 years ago. So I guess I'm, I'm very trendy now, but now I don't eat anywhere. Um, and, and he's also decrying the, 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 the claims, and I hear this all the time, just yesterday, in fact, that fine dining is dead. Can I say that fine dining is alive and well with the same people that it always has been, and that is rich people. And now, because of the pandemic, rich people have become richer. So they don't mind spending $500 a person uh, for dinner. And you know what? That's what it now costs in a fine dining restaurant. I had to note, um, somebody invited us to... um, the River Cafe here in Brooklyn, which is our big fine dining restaurant here in Brooklyn, uh, and and uh, invited us to dinner. And I, so I, I went to look at the menu just because I wanted to see, oh, what do they have on the menu these days? It is open and it's extremely safe. They only uh, uh, reserve half capacity, and they do have a room that has some open air if you want it. Not not when it's twenty five degrees, but anyway. Um, so I noted I, the the pr- fixed price menu and a very very elaborate very high end ingredient menu is that if I forget now one hundred and sixty five or one hundred and eighty five dollars a person so of course that's two hundred and fifty dollars a person um, without drinking you know what it ends up that's a bargain I, I a friend of mine took his wife out for her 40th birthday, it was $850 for the two of them uh, without drinking. They each just had a cocktail. So I, mean, I don't consider that drinking. But a cocktail is now 20 bucks in New York, if not more. So uh, you've got to be rich always to, have, <laughs> to go to these restaurants, and nothing has changed, and they're still there. Um, I, on the other hand, I would say that and Michael points out, by the way, that fewer fine dining restaurants closed during the pandemic than did the lower end restaurants. So then Michael has a list of buzzwords, and I have a little comment on all of them. Labna, I had no idea that Labna was a thing, except uh, after I read Michael's comment, I realized my, my nephew has gotten his daughters, who were five and eight, to ask for labneh, so I guess labneh is in the air. Labneh is basically strained yogurt. It's pretty much the same thing as Greek yogurt. Um, depends on it, it, it should have some live acidophilus in it. Biria. I've talked to Michael about biria. He says biria is everywhere, and he is right. But you know what? Biria is not worth seeking out. Biria is a a stew that uh, uh, we have a taco place here in Brooklyn that started the whole deal in Brooklyn with uh, birria tacos. But now I noticed the other day uh, it was birria in some place that wasn't even Mexican. So he's right about that. He cites Mexican brunches. Well, the only reason people go out for Mexican brunches is because they want endless margaritas. <clears throat> we have a place in the neighborhood here, not Mexican, that has security guards. On the, well, not during the pandemic, but pre-pandemic, used to have to have security guards for their brunch because they had unlimited whatever. Um, Pan-Asian smokehouse restaurants. I don't know about that, Michael. I got the one. The one I know about closed. I just learned uh, boutique fruit vinegars. Use it if somebody gives it to you as a gift. Do not seek out a boutique fruit vinegar. Pot pies from upscale restaurants. These are all trends, Michael says. I don't like pot pies from upscale restaurants. They invariably have uh, puff pastry on top, and I prefer uh, regular short pastry. multi culti kachapuri. Now, kachapuri is Georgian, as in the Republic of Georgia, if it's still a republic, uh, of Georgia, Cheese bread, and there are many kinds of of cheese bread of kachapuri. I go to a Georgian bakery in uh, on Kings Highway in Brooklyn, where 
they have several, in just that one little bakery, several kinds of kachapuri. But i got to ask him, where's multi-culti kachapuri? Chili crunch, I mentioned that. That's this uh, condiment. Um, jackfruit. I had to look up jackfruit. Why is jackfruit on Michael's trends list? And the reason is, it's now be it's an enormous thing. This jackfruit, I've seen it in the Chinese stores. It 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 it's used as a uh, fish and chicken substitute. Now that's another trend Michael cites: fake chicken and fish. Like we now have fake meat. You know these Impossible Burgers. Yeah. Soon you're going to have Impossible Chicken Nuggets. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I'm going to go on and on about this, but most of it is like, who cares? Like espresso martinis, uh, fusion ramen. Ramen's a fusion thing to begin with. Um, and extreme, I love this one. Thank you, Michael. Extreme hummus variations. <laughs> I love hummus, but I like plain old lemon, garlic, tahini, chickpea hummus. Not, I don't yeah. need any added ingredients. And pasta alla gricia, something that is incredible. I'm surprised it's on his list. I've got to ask him when he last had a good pasta alla gricia. It's a very, pasta alla gricia is spaghetti, usually spaghetti, with uh, pancetta, but really guanciale, and some cheese and the pasta cooking water, and it comes up with a nice emulsified sauce, and it's all very good. That makes me want to, I'll drink to that but with eggnog. So this is a Jewish family that every Christmas for the last at least 40 years has been making what we call spoonable eggnog. And if you can't make it this week, I pity you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I'm a custard guy. And eggnog is not much more than liquid custard. So I'm always up for custard. But the one that my family has been making, which we learned from our friend Angela Capalbo, who is Italian-American and legitimately <laughs> could make a Christmas eggnog, is this is, like, this is dessert. It's not something to drink. It's something you serve in a cup with a spoon. I say cup because you don't want to have too much of this. So let's, you could put it on the table you know, in a cup and saucer and a spoon to eat it with. And what makes it spoonable is that instead of you using liquid uh, cream, you use whipped cream and fold it into a egg yolk base. So the egg yolk base is four egg yolks. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, and you gradually, with a whisk, beat in a half of a cup of sugar and an eighth of a teaspoon of salt, a big pinch of salt, and keep beating until the yolks are really thick and lemon-colored. Now you add your booze. I like rum in my eggnog, and Angela always used rum. But got to say, a little brandy couldn't hide. Um, that's a very good substitute for rum. Uh, you could even use bourbon. Uh, I might try it this year with rye whiskey, because I'm loving rye whiskey. It's got a spicy feel to it. I do have some good rum in the house, though, so I, so I don't know. Anyway, a half a cup of whatever booze you're going to use. Um, this is not for kids, obviously. And uh, you beat that in. And then instead of uh, – now you beat the four egg whites separately, and you beat two cups of heavy cream separately, and you fold both of those into your egg yolk base. So basically, you've got eggnog fluff. It is so good, and you don't have to eat very much of it. Literally, a half a cup per person is is enough. And so this feeds about eight people. Not so bad, right? A half an egg per person. It's only a little bit of sugar, a little bit of booze, and a lot of cream. Right, like six hundred. Five, five six hundred. Five six hundred calories, probably. <coughs> Excuse me, I haven't added it up, and truthfully, I wouldn't. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't want to think about it. Um, it, it you know, uh, I've been making something related to um, eggnog. Uh, I didn't quite realize it was related until I started reading about eggnog the other day, just 
just because I all of a sudden decided to read about eggnog. Uh, eggnog uh, is the predecessor of, or it could be the successor to posset, P-O-S-S-E-T. I've talked about this on the air. Posset, um, uh, I, I first discovered in uh, in a restaurant in Dublin a number of years ago, not that long ago, and uh, even my Irish friend who I was with didn't know about it, and we learned about it afterwards. And then just recently, Jacques Pepin, in his Facebook uh, feed of little cooking lessons, uh, said, I wish I'd known about this 40 years ago, and it was possible. So I, I make the, uh, basically it's the, the version. I mean, if you go online, you'll find maybe slightly different amount of sugar, but that's all. I, well, I, for one cup of cream, I, I heat one cup of cream with one-third of a cup of sugar. You could reduce that to a quarter of a cup if you like a very tart posset. Uh, but I, at least a quarter of a cup. Uh, I use a third. And you stir that over medium heat until it starts to simmer at the edge. And when it starts to simmer at the edge... Um, and the sugar should be dissolved by then, um, time it for three minutes and let it simmer without boiling up and over um, for three minutes exactly. Have ready three tablespoons of lemon juice. I used lime juice once because this is related to key lime pie, by the way, but I didn't like the flavor as much as I like it with lemon. Three tablespoons of lemon juice, uh, take it off the heat, and as soon as it stops simmering, has calmed down, add the lemon juice. And then I always pour it into a measuring cup because it has a spout and easy to pour. And that one cup of cream with three tablespoons of lemon juice and a third of a cup of sugar makes four tiny servings. And my tiny serving, if you're counting carbohydrates, has 19 carbs. So that's almost as much as you want to have in a day if you're on a keto diet. But you could have more. You know, some people eat more than that. Anyway, I, I would say that that's enough. It's really the most creamy, custardy thing you can imagine. Posset. So eggnog is apparently related to posset. The original posset, by the way, was curdled milk to which you added beer or ale and uh, maybe a spice and drank that. That was medieval posset. God bless him. Okay. Uh, you know, I do too much reading. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> About posset and eggnog. <laughs> some, great, uh, some great things for the holiday. By the way, just... Anyway, to... yeah, we're going to have that. We're going to have that. We're going to have our eggnog. Uh, we had posses just last night. <laughs> That's so easy for me to whip up. I, I like eggnog, but I can only have one thing. And I, there's a company that sells uh, here, a dairy company that sells. Remember the, when you used to go to school, the little milk cartons? They, they were real yeah. small, oh, one yeah. serving. Well, they have they, they have these one serving milk cartons of eggnog, because really that's all you need. Oh. You don't need more than that. You don't need more than that, three. No, ounces. that's true. And you know, I I also have seen uh, in my searching around about eggnog, a lot of complaints about uh, the eggnog they sell in in the supermarket. But I always found that to be <laughs> very satisfying. Yeah. There are good brands of cartoned eggnog. I'm sure. I must have found them in my life. Because, I, I mean, it's not something I indulge in very often, uh, hardly ever. But but. Certainly, I've enjoyed cartons of eggnog. So you might not want to buy. And also, if you're worried about raw eggs, you can make a cooked eggnog. You know, you can you beat your eggs, egg yolks, and uh, sugar together. Um, add the cream and or milk or half and half, whatever your liquid is, and cook it. It's a custard. Just make it a thin custard. That one, and then at the end, you can fold in whipped cream if you want to make it thicker. All right. Or the egg whites, I should say. Not the, you already used your cream. Right. Yeah. All right. But, uh, yeah, yeah, this makes me hungry. All right, well, I want you to have a great uh, weekend and, and a nice and you holiday too, weekend. Everybody, Merry Christmas. Won't get to talk to you until after. And then we have New Year's to deal with. All right, you can start planning the New Year show. <laughs> Well, I, I go to sleep by ten o'clock. Okay. I've been I've been invited to two parties, but I said I'm sorry, I I won't make it through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Arthur. I'm, all right, take care, everyone.